We're in the rooms of Clive Staples Lewis, known to his friends as Jack, in Magdalen College, Cambridge. Lewis, for 30 years, had been at Magdalen College, Oxford, Magdalen without the E. But in the early months of 1954, Cambridge University decided that they wanted to establish a chair in medieval and Renaissance English literature. Lewis was indirectly, informally invited to apply, and apply he did. He was given the chair, but turned it down after he realised that he would, it would mean abandoning his brother Warney uh, in Oxford, who was sadly prone to bouts of drinking and depression, and his long-suffering, faithful gardener, Paxton. Cambridge University were understandably disappointed and offered the chair to their second choice. It was only after the diplomatic intervention of none other than J.R.R. Tolkien, Lewis's old friend uh, in the English faculty at Oxford, that Lewis was finally persuaded to reapply for the chair that was always meant to be his. The second choice appointment, Dame Helen Gardner, to her credit, agreed that this chair was tailor-made for Lewis, and so herself turned it down. Uh, Cambridge was delighted, and Sir Henry Willink, who was chairman of the electors, vice-chancellor of the university, and master of Magdalen with an E, wrote to Lewis in June 1954, saying, Number two has declined, and I am filled with hope that after all, Cambridge will obtain the acceptance of number one, in spite of the fact that number one will appear to number two to have been number two. But then came the second hurdle. Lewis's appointment was a university appointment, and so no college affiliation or residency rights came with that appointment. Willink, who, as I said, was both vice-chancellor of Cambridge University and master of Magdalen, wrote to Lewis in his capacity as vice-chancellor, saying, I am sure you can rely on rooms within the walls of a college, and I hope very much that you will feel disposed to write to the Master of Magdalen, as the head of your sister college at Oxford, inquiring if there was a possibility of making your Cambridge home within its walls, before accepting any of the other invitations, which may not improbably come to you. Lewis got the message, and wrote a first reply to Willink. To the Vice-Chancellor, Thank you for your letter. I feel much pleasure and gratitude in accepting the chair of medieval and renaissance English. And then a second reply to Willink. To the Master of Magdalen. Dear Master, the Vice-Chancellor has suggested that I should ask if there is any possibility of making my Cambridge home in Magdalen. Needless to say, the Master accepted, and Lewis made plans to move. The plan was for him to commute from uh, his home in Oxford, in Headington, uh, known as the Kilns, where his uh, brother would uh, stay permanently, and to commute to Cambridge on Tuesday mornings, going back to Oxford on Friday afternoon on the, a train known affectionately as the Cantab Crawler. This meant that the meetings of the Inklings in Eagle and Child in Oxford were moved from Tuesday mornings to Monday mornings, um, but the institution continued. Um, so we're here to discuss Lewis's arrival at Magdalen uh, with Bishop Simon and the impact of Lewis on the culture, the intellectual culture of Cambridge at the time, uh, and specifically on the intellectual culture within Magdalen, what it was like to know Lewis personally, and uh, also to inquire a little bit about what Lewis was working on at the time, uh, the various books that he was devoting himself to in the last years of his life. Bishop Simon, what were your first memories on arriving at Magdalen in, in 1956 of Lewis as a man? Well, of course, I knew a great deal about him already and had read some of his books, obviously, and it was... I felt it was, he, he was a bit formidable, as it were, for that reason alone, partly, and also he had a certain apparent reserve at first, which wasn't really very much. And indeed, he was quite genial at the high table. And I think I met him there first at the high table, in fact. 
and fairly soon I'd forgotten my nervousness of him because I was enjoying our conversation and the way in which he drew one out and I very much appreciated his um, way of drawing in anything one had said oneself and making something of it. So, yes, I enjoyed him from the start. And Lewis was an exceptionally gifted conversationalist, wasn't he? Very good at uh, getting people to open up and very interested in what they had to say and what they read about their ideas. Yes, I think that uh, he didn't even try to do that in a way. He just sp- talked in such a way that it happened spontaneously, as it were, because one had enjoyed what he'd said. And once one realised that he was interested, one could easily start talking with him. I enjoyed that very much. And I remember him, I think somehow, I can't remember how we got on to George MacDonald, but we did at some point quite early on. I may even have known that it was an enthusiasm of his because I don't think he'd mentioned it before. Um, But I did mention that I'd grown up with George MacDonald as a boy one night in Hall, and and not George MacDonald himself, but his books, I hasten to say, and how I loved these and had gone on reading him. And this um, he responded to very warmly and was obviously very pleased by it because he invited me up to this room afterwards as a result of that. Hmm. And we talked about George MacDonald a bit. And um, I remember that's the first time that I saw this very chair in which I'm sitting and how he used to have his books on this. I'm not sure he didn't seat me in this chair. I can't quite remember that. But certainly, um, I remember it being here in the room. And we had such fun that evening uh, talking about George MacDonald. I mentioned to him how much he he had meant to me. And uh, this made a very good starting point. And those conversations over MacDonald in uh, Hall, in the combination room, here in his own rooms, would go on long into the night and... But he would rise very early, wouldn't he? And he would go to chapel. Um, and I suppose you would have been as chaplain of the college officiating at those ceremonies. Absolutely, mm-hmm. yes. And mm-hmm. uh, he went, we went through all the psalms, mm-hmm. which he liked doing. Mm-hmm. I did in those days anyway. Yes. Um, yes. And often I was the only person there. Mm. So it was very nice having him. At the time, as you were reading through the Psalter with Lewis... Uh, during morning, uh, during morning chapel, Lewis, though you probably weren't aware of this, was engaged uh, with T. S. Eliot and others in um, a new translation of the Psalms for uh, for the prayer book, and also was devoting himself to writing a book that later became Reflections on the Psalms, the only book he devoted specifically to. Um, a book of the Bible, um, and the last book, I think, that was published before he died. Yes, that's quite true. I don't, I'm afraid I haven't read that. I mm. should have, because the Psalms are one thing that I read with him mm. quite regularly. And he was very happy that we had the um, original, I mean, the version in the prayer book. He loved that. So obviously he didn't want to depart from that altogether into any translated version. <laughs> but we had a, a, a happy interest in that connection. Mm. And it was that that brought out the whole idea of George MacDonald somehow in our talking together. So this would have been the short walk to chapel and would. after that he would uh, come out onto the quad and over there we can see the motto of Maudlin, Gauda Tafwa. Into the court, as we call it Into here. Into the court, of course. And yes. he probably would have had to have got used to switching yes. the, yes, I think the, the language from Oxford to Cambridge. Yes. But the motto up there is Gauda Tafwa, medieval French for keep and thy protect faith. thy mm. faith. And I suppose Lewis, more than anyone in the 20th century, made it possible for Christian believers to do that. Absolutely right. 
it's make it's an extraordinary appropriate motto mm. for a college where he felt very much at home. Mm. Mm. So, so this is the college chapel. Yes, where the where morning prayer is still said today, of course. Yes, I would say it from over there. Mm -hmm. uh, but CSL would be sitting. Jack, as we called him, would be sitting here. This, this would be where he'd be, joining very sonorously and effectively in the Psalms. We said the alternate verses, as we still do in the mornings here. But he was certainly a man of routine, so after chapel he would have breakfast, he would deal with his correspondence, and then very often go for walks on his own, uh, but occasionally he would ask others to come with him. He would, absolutely, and he invited me a number of times. I think he probably liked walking on his own, uh, but at the same time he was very happy to use it as a means of, of making friends with somebody whom he was interested in talking to further, and I was lucky enough to be in that, there in that capacity. So he, he would invite me when he wanted to come along. The thing I loved about those walks by the river was that he um, always, in his company, things always seemed a little bit stranger. I remember our being st struck together by the way in which a man appeared the size of a giant. It was just, he was working in the fields, and it was just his interrelation with a rather small, as it turned out, haystack in the distance. But it, it made him appear very large and out of proportion. And Jack said, almost seriously, let's rush off to Fenditon, the next village, uh, and tell them that the giants have come. <laughs> you could almost believe he was going to do it. <laughs> we often walked along Ditton Fields. I remember it particularly because I remember at the time that the swans descended so beautifully on the river in the way they do, settling gradually and streaming along the river. And we both watched this spe spectacle, and I exclaimed, not meaning in any way to impress him or anything, but just something came naturally to me. Look thy last on all things lovely every hour. To which he replied, no, no, no. Look thy first on all things lovely. And it was from that that the conversation turned to the way in which he saw everything good and beautiful as an anticipation of what was to come, which to me was a fascinating idea. It was one of the key things that I picked up from him, I think. And that theme of being drawn to another world is what I think he called joy, which was for Lewis almost a, a technical term, and it's the theme that runs right through his spiritual autobiography, surprised by joy. And by that, Lewis seems to have meant moments of what the Germans call Sehnsucht, uh, longing, a sense of desire for, for something else. Uh, and there's Mac George MacDonald is one of the writers who most captured, who best captured that for Lewis. One of the <sighs> moments of, one of the earliest experiences of joy, uh, Lewis recalls, was on reading George MacDonald's Fantastes, which was no doubt why he was so excited to learn that you were familiar with MacDonald as well. Yes, he expounded that in a variety of ways very vividly and, and attractively. Uh, and I, I picked that up very much from him. Mm. There was a sense that at Magdalen Oxford, Lewis seemed to many of the fellows to be something of, of a dinosaur. But when he came to Magdalen Cambridge, I, I understand he was warmly welcomed. Yes. Uh, the fellows of Magdalen at that time were largely Christian, from what I can remember. And certainly the people who rapidly became closest to him, like Dick Ladborough and others, uh, were enthusiasts for his having come. And I don't think there's anyone there who wasn't happy about his being there. Mm. Mm. So he, he did definitely feel welcome. Mm. Mm. There's an anecdote about 
Lewis writing a short note to Dick Ladborough, which he left in his pigeonhole, that went, Dear Dick, may I call you that? Yours, Jack. Excellent. There was a great informality about him, wasn't there? Yes, absolutely. That's very typical. And from the start, people accepted that and entered into a good relationship with him. And he seemed to be very happy to be there, which was encouraging. So Lewis was an incredibly sociable person, very interested in others, as we've been discussing, a brilliant conversationalist. But he was quite reserved when it came to talking about what he was engaged with in his own intellectual life. Um, One might not have known, sitting with him at High Table at Magdalen in the late 50s, and you yourself may not have been aware of just how prolific he was as uh, as a writer over that period from 56 to 1963. Um, He uh, wrote The Four Loves, which is a a sort of minor masterpiece, uh, Letters to Malcolm, chiefly on prayer, uh, a short book on the Psalms, Reflections on the Psalms. Uh, He was also engaged with uh, writing The Discarded Image, which is one of the great works of literary criticism uh, that he produced and is still much read by, by undergraduates today. And he was reserved also about the struggles he was experiencing in his private life. I think shortly after his arrival at Magdalen, uh, arrangements were made for Joy to move into the kilns with Warney. Um, and it's around about that time that uh, the news came through that she was very seriously ill. Mm. What were your own memories and recollections of, of Joy herself? Uh, not very clearly w- exactly when it was, but I remember her coming down and meeting her mm-hmm. and getting on quite well with her. Mm-hmm. And I enjoyed her from the start, really. And I think that, uh, I, that it was quite natural for me to get drawn into his anxiety about it uh, when she was not well mm-hmm. and so on and mm-hmm. discussing that with, with him. Mm-hmm. So from the start, I think I felt a good relationship with Joy and an interest in talking about the suffering that she was going through and how one bore another suffering and that kind of thing with him. Mm. So I thought that began very easily, developed easily for me. Mm. Lewis was quite clear that he felt he'd witnessed a miracle when Joy went from apparently Uh, inoperable cancer at death's door to recovering so quickly that she was able they were all able they were able together with the Lancelin Greens to have a holiday in Greece in 1960 and Lewis says that around about that time almost exactly at that time he began to suffer from a very severe pain in his back and he believed that there had been a, a genuine exchange uh, of pain, a, a co-suffering that God had allowed him uh, with joy, a, a genuine sympathy. We used to talk about her illness when he was here quite a bit, and about he talked about the way in which they, he, he wondered if he could share her pain in a way which he, Charles Williams, whom he introduced me to, of course, not the person but the books, um, uh, made such play of the idea that we could take on each other's pains and he was hoping in some way he was doing or could do that not least because he had a pain in his back which actually was the thing a hint of what was later going to finish him off eventually Uh, but it didn't recur very much then but I think that that he he felt perhaps he was bearing something of her pain it was it was quite touching I thought that and it was a new idea to me I acquired through him from Charles Williams a sort of interchange of, of suffering. And then in the late 1950s, you went to work at Abaddon University in Nigeria for a time. And on your return from Africa, um, he was ill. He was staying in Oxford in the kilns at the time. And I think he invited you to visit him, didn't he? Yes, I did when I came back. He invited me to go. And I enjoyed very much. I took Jean to see him, which he wanted, and he then talked freely. Actually, it was at that time that I had one of the most exciting 
talks with him in a way because he knew that he was dying. Mm. He said that he had been up to the very gates and he was quite enthusiastic about it in an extraordinary way. And um, he, he saw it all as a prospect which was now appealing to him. Of course, Joy had died long before and so on. And, and it, as something towards which he was moving, as it were. And uh, I remember that conversation very vividly. Jean came in just to meet him for a bit and then went off tactfully shopping or something. And we stayed and had this talk. And I've always remembered that, how he talked about his anticipation, as it were, and having been up to the very gates already. So that um, it was a fascinating time in which to just call in on him and see, see him renew it renew these awarenesses again. How would you sum up Lewis's impact on your own Christian life, on your own intellectual development as a Christian? Well, I think that he was someone who conveyed a very vivid impression somehow of this sense of the other world, sense of a wider world, and that all the time I, I thoroughly appreciated and enjoyed uh, the way in which in his presence one was more aware of that somehow. So I'd say he, he had a biggest impact on me in that kind of way, really. And a lot of these other stories grow out of that and are hints of that, really. That, that quality he had of an awareness of something much more uh, to the world in general than I'd had before. I owed that to him and it stayed with me. Um, wonderful coats of arms up here. Finem prospiciens, looking towards the end. Mm. Which is rather sums up your last meeting with him, where he spoke of having been at death's door, and yes, and then oh, it's hard, very bad. almost yes. looking forward to it with excitement and it anticipation. Was. It was. Yes, that is absolutely true. I can remember the, the sensation now. I find it most moving and exciting somehow. <laughs>